You've entered Bookstorm with Kristen Civiletto and me, Chris Storm. This is a podcast devoted to best-selling books that matter, books that make a difference. We're diving down deep with beloved authors about their stories. We're exposing hot-button topics and heartfelt themes, the issues that affect each of us in our own lives as siblings, parents, partners, friends, as human beings. We're braving new ideas, fresh thoughts, hard lessons and important truths. Those kinds of things that stay with us long after we turn the last page and close the book. Welcome back to Bookstorm Podcast, book lovers literally all around the world. We are humbled and grateful. I think we're being listened to in over 60 countries, over a thousand cities, and almost 50 states from coast to coast. We know why you're here. You love great books. You love great authors. We have one with us here today. Welcome, Greg Hurwitz. Thank you for having me. And hi, everybody in all those countries around the globe. We're super excited to have Greg Hurwitz here today. Talk about his Orphan X series and this book that Kristen and I loved, The Last Orphan. But before we dive down deep, I want to give you a little history on Greg, because we know we've got a lot of Greg Hurwitz fans out there, but maybe there's some things you don't know about him. Did you know he's the New York Times number one internationally bestselling author of the Orphan X series? Did you know he's won so many literary awards and accolades for his novels? He's been published in 33 languages. He currently serves as co-president of the International Thriller Writers. Pretty cool. He's written screenplays, television scripts for many of the major studios and networks. He's written comics for AWA, including the critically acclaimed anthology New Think, DC and Marvel. He's written poetry, political and cultural pieces for the Wall Street Journal, The Guardian, The Bulwark and others. And Kristen and I thought this was very cool. He helped write the opening ceremony for the 2022 World Cup. Wow, I had to go back and listen to that. I got to give you some praise for the Orphan X series. It's a long list. I got to cut it short, but here's who loved it. Instant New York Times bestseller. Instant number one international bestseller. USA Today bestseller. Washington Post, Publishers Weekly bestseller. Number one Sunday Times bestseller number one Amazon bestseller. But if I don't stop there, we're not going to hear Greg talk. And that's why we're here. So I got to move on. Going to give one endorsement because she's a friend of Bookstorm Podcast. We love her. We've had her on the show. Karen Slaughter says, The Last Orphan is a top-notch thriller, an action-packed joyride. Readers will not want to put it down. And Karen, guess what? Kristen and I could not agree more. Thrilled to have Greg with us here today. Thank you. That is that is not a harsh uh, journalistic cross examination so far. So I'm enjoying <laughs> this interview. <clears throat> no, no, no. We dive deep. Just wait. Mm -hmm. uh, well, of course, we're here to talk about the Last Orphan, and this is in your Orphan X series. And I thought I would give our listeners just a little bit of the background of the series, just so, so they're up to speed. We won't give away any spoilers, and I would love at the end if you wanted to add anything, but very quickly. Okay. Um, your Orphan X novels, of course, follow a beloved character, Evan Smoke. He's now known as the Nowhere Man. When Evan was a child, he was selected for a secret black box program where he was trained as an assassin. He was lethal, effective, and very smart. Evan was Orphan X until he broke with the program and used everything in his arsenal of skills to disappear and kind of go off grid. Now, we meet him in this story. He is remade as the Nowhere Man. He is dedicated to helping the most desperate people in their time of trouble. And he's finding that he's slowly reappearing on the government's radar. He had tried to disappear for a bit because, of course, they are starting to eliminate these orphans because they know too much. They've done too much. Now, here, he's been doing a pretty good job of staying off the government's radar until he makes a little mistake in this book. And, of course, I'm not going to give away any of these spoilers. 
But now the president has him in her control and she offers Evan a deal. She basically says, eliminate a rich, powerful man that she believes is dangerous and she'll let Evan survive. Now, when he left the program, he swore to use his skills only against those who really deserve it. But now he is being called to make some decisions about his principles or his life. I would love if you wanted to add anything to that, Greg, anything you want to Look, I mean, that was a spectacular summary and introduction. And so far, I'm just watching with admiration. <laughs> awesome. Well, if you are ready to brave the storm, we'll let Chris kick us off. Okay, so I've got to say, I can't help myself. Thank you, Orphan X, Nowhere Man, Evan Smoke, for showing us how to fight for good, even if we're the only one, even if nobody thanks us, even if we have to dedicate our life to it. And thank you, Greg Hurwitz, for creating this imperfect, yet perfectly admirable character. So I gotta ask you, I love this character, the young Ruby. She witnesses a horrific murder scene. Evan knows what she's seeing, he's seen it before. He says, and I wanna quote, the earth had cracked open beneath her feet and she was in a free fall. The dizzying aftermath of trauma where the world and your place in it zoom in and out. When notions and dimensions and scale no longer hold, when you're, my, you're reminded you're just a speck floating through an experiential infinity you cannot possibly comprehend. Wow. Ruby calls them monsters. They're evil people. She says it doesn't become less just because we named them. So you showed us as the author that there are things in this world that are so evil that they're beyond our comprehension. Evan dealt with it by fighting back. Ruby dealt with it by naming it but they both dealt with it by acknowledging it. What traits did you instill as the author and creator of these beloved characters that helped them to face these monsters that maybe we could all learn from in the real world? Well, for me, the key line around which the whole series coalesces, and I use it in every single book in the series, is when Jack first takes 12-year-old Evan out of a foster home and he says to him, he explains what the program is, that he's going to be raised to be an assassin. And he says, the hard part won't be making you a killer. The hard part will be keeping you human. In a lot of ways, that's embedding in him a tragic flaw. It's much easier to be a true believer. It's much easier to be, to sort of dress yourself in country or ideology. But because Jack loved this kid, as much as he was training him to do these horrible things, he kept the, the sort of guttering pilot light alive inside him. And there's another thing he says to Evan that I think is really key. Evan, when he was chosen out of the foster home, he wasn't the biggest, toughest kid. And Evan in real life, I, I describe him the same way in every book. I say, just an average guy, not too handsome. He's not the most dashing guy like Bond. He's not the biggest guy like Reacher. He's not the best shot like Swagger. He has to bring the totality of who he is to every mission of all these different types of training. I think of him in some ways as He's like a, a blue collar Renaissance man. Um, and there's another thing that Jack tells him because he was this scrawny little kid who got knocked down more than anybody else when Jack was observing him in the foster home. And he tells him, you might've got knocked down the most times, but you also got up the most. And when he first has Evan, he tells him, you know what it feels like to be vulnerable. You know what that feels like in your bones. Don't you ever forget that? Because for what we're gonna train you to be and to do, you have to carry that with you at all times. And so he's somebody who was trained with this sort of deep humility of having been raised feeling powerless and feeling vulnerable. And that's something that Jack never lets him forget. And so he brings that into these exchanges where he may not be able to live an ordinary life, like all the people who he helps, like Ruby and her family. He's kind of got his face up to the glass and he's looking at them, but he, as a wolf who hunts other wolves, can at least preserve for them the type of life that he himself might never be able to have. And that's a key aspect of his engagements. And, you know, this is what we really loved about him. Um, I was saying to Kristen before we got started, I liked that he was not perfect, that there were moments even in the story where he, where he had a little meltdown. He had to go and regroup. Um, it, it's something we can all relate to. So yeah, he is a fantasy character. Um, We've had them in our history before, Robin Hood, Batman, Superman, people we love, people we want to emulate. 
people we want to be like in, in there has, you made something in him show us that maybe there's something in us in the real world that we can also fight for good. Maybe we don't have to be perfect. Did you do that on purpose? Yes. You know, when I was younger in my career, I used to think about things in terms of villains and heroes. And the further along that I get and the, the better that I come to know myself also, you know, the more I realize that I want to write antagonists and protagonists, that having a moral complexity that's embedded in my character and having these cases like in, in The Last Orphan, the, the genius billionaire whose name is Luke Devine, right? And he represents a lot of renegade billionaires who I've, who I've met and many of whom we're familiar with through the news cycle, um, represents in some ways the opposite uh, of what Evan is, right? He's sort of the intellect that falls in love with itself. Um, and Evan does everything based in the real world. He doesn't deal with abstractions. He doesn't want to deal with politics. He doesn't, he's done the whole uh, being hired to commit executions in non-compliant zones in the U.S. around the world. He doesn't want to get involved. He cares about one person. He cares about one young woman who was killed, one young man who was killed at one of these giant Gatsby-esque parties that Luke Devine um, throws, you know, with recorders in every room. He kind of has these big Gatsby parties. He invites Supreme Court justices and heads of cable news networks. And he puts every sin on display and just films them. So he's got this unbelievable extortion network. But Evan doesn't care about all the bigger machinations of power. He cares about taking these small steps. And Luke's got very good arguments. And I, what I realize is, is that the more that it's, it's a close situation, that Evan's muddling through this sort of very complicated moral situation and still somehow trying to emerge, trying to figure out some order um, and some justice to emerge out of this, out of the chaos and out of, out of the death and out of the suffering. And when you have a character who tries to do that, despite their imperfections and despite the imperfections with the world, that's the point I think that becomes relatable. And one of the ways I describe Evan, is I say, he never learned to speak the strange language of intimacy. I think of him in a lot of ways, like he's Pinocchio at the start of the series, but he wants to be a real boy. He's trying to figure this out. And so his OCD will come up and roar. He gets locked down in the 10 to 10 assassins commandments. There's all these different tools. And part of what's happening is the, the, the series itself is really the story of him becoming human, of him shedding some of the armor. And armor, of course, protects us, but it limits our flexibility. And so we're seeing the Ten Commandments give way. We're seeing him start to have more, to navigate more complex moral choices with complex flawed people as his own flaws are going up with them. Because if you exist in a, in a vacuum all by yourself in his little world, he can maintain his assassin's perfection. But other people are messy. And when he engages with them, he realizes that he's messy too. And that those flaws scraping, grinding into each other, in some ways, it's like the process of sharpening ourselves to like cut ourselves open and see what's inside. And that's a lot of what, about what these missions are. They're about him having to relate to people in ways that are uncomfortable to him, that are emotional or psychological, that he has to try to empathize and engage with their suffering and their pain and learn something. And to do that, part of him has to die and a new part has to be born. And that's what each mission is to him. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's pretty cool. And hey, isn't that all of us in a way? We got to learn all how to empathize. Us. We got to put some of ourselves away. And that's why we love him so much. Thank you. I don't, I don't think it's a coincidence that I, start, I started this series when I was 39. I was right on the cusp of 40. And I think that's the age, at least it was for me, where we start to let go of a lot of the rules or dictates or stories that have governed, let's say the first half of our life, if we're fortunate. And, you know, it's easy to get rid of things that don't serve us. It's easy to figure out things that are flaws or unhealthy or really destructive. It's much harder to let go of survival instincts and mechanisms that have actually served us well, that protected us, that guided us, that helped build our life and our identity. And the series, Orphan X, starts right in the process of Evan breaking all 10 of the Assassin's Commandments. That's the first book, is him having to figure out how to let go of this definition of himself if he wants there to be more to his life. And I think that is all of us. There's no, there's no growth without suffering or you know, the harsh light of awareness 
bringing us to a point that we recognize what we have to let go of if we want to grow more or differently uh, in relation to other people, in relation to our own identification with meaning. And that's very much what the series is about. Every challenge that happens, it's not just that we're watching an action sequence. You know, we all have had that feeling reading a book where you're just getting punched in the face with action and you don't care. It's all got to come down to character. It's all got to come down to how his interface with other people is something that he is growing and moving towards and struggling with within himself. That's all that I'm interested mm -hmm. in. And the reader too. We loved it. Oh yeah, Thank that's you. so well put. Um, I want to dive in a little deeper on something you were just talking about a second ago, and that is this idea of justice and some of our feelings towards how we regard justice. Many people, I think, have lost faith in the criminal justice system. Uh, they believe that maybe the rich or powerful escape consequences, or they believe the system is rigged, or that maybe agendas control who gets prosecuted. And I've heard people express all of these things. I teach law students, so I've even heard that from law students going into this. And I wanted to ask you about this because Orphan X, Evan, in some ways has kind of removed himself from the system in some respects. And I really love the fact that he trained himself and Jack instilled in him the necessity of these guardrails. He has these principles by which he lived that, you know, of course, Jack talked to him about and that he repeats to himself even throughout the book, kind of reminding himself. I was thinking they were almost a metaphor for morality. But what happens when people take yeah. justice? into their own hands and they don't have guiding principles. Is that just chaos? It is chaos. And you're right. What he does is what Jack trains him. And I think this is where we've lost our way. A lot of ways culturally is I think that our paragons or our avatars of meaning are kind of moving and floating away from the actual meaning itself. I'll, I'll just give a quick example. Of course, you remember the college admission scandal. Right. And it just captivated the international attention. I think in some ways, part of that was because what should happen if you're a parent and you bribe somebody and you fake your kid's resume and you fake that they're on a sports team or you fake their extracurriculars and you fake the embodiment of who they are is they should get to a school like Stanford or USC or Yale and they should flunk out because they're not USC or Yale or Stanford material. But in a way, we all know that that's not how it works anymore, right? And that you can just sort of bribe and get people in. And there, and I think it was one of those instances where the avatars of meaning to go to a kind of a fancy school and get a fancy degree, of course, which, which, which can be earned and magnificent and a spectacular experience for some people. But it's floating away to some extent the same way that the notion that our politicians are elected to serve the best interests of the community at large seems to have floated away. We have a lot of values that seem to be increasingly removed. And I think that part of that is, it's one of the things that I wrote about with Luke Devine in this. Luke in a lot of ways is like Milton's Lucifer in Paradise Lost. He's the intellect that falls in love with itself and thinks it can convince itself that it can be or do anything. And what Jack does and what Evan's training is, is to align First, it's the tactical and it's the strategic. And if you pay close enough attention and do them properly, they're actually aligned with the moral. And if all those things are aligned, then you can go in and have an engagement in the culture where you either make a tackle without breaking your back because you're aligned, right? Or there's a chance to have some kind of transformational change. And so when you're talking about this and the fact that it will all be chaos, there's something that's quite different about Evan than most other vigilantes, right? We're used to these characters who flout the law, right? Who from James, from Charles Bronson to superheroes to John Wick to whatever it is. And Evan in The Last Orphan, before he goes to meet Luke and to try to make some version of a moral, strategic and tactical choice of what he can hold on to and feel is concrete enough to be executionable, to execute a mission. But one of the things that he recognizes is that, I'm just trying to think how to say this. He says to Naomi Templeton when he's captured, and she says, well, what happens if we've captured you, you're outside the law? And his answer is, I should be put to death. That's what should happen. I will act outside the law to fill in the cracks in the corruption in the justice system and to help people who are being terrorized, terrorized at the hands of the law, terrorized at the hands of other humans due to corruption, due to malice. But I also understand that if that becomes normal, right, 
all of society will deteriorate. So I'm willing to actually shoulder the consequences of the moral choices that I make. And I should be prosecuted or put in the ground in order to protect the biggest or the bigger order that's around. And that's something that's a fairly unique piece of reasoning when it comes to a lot of the heroes that we tend to engage with. And so an answer to your question is yes, that is precisely what will happen. And part of Evan's movement towards becoming a human is a movement towards recognizing more and more the full humanity of those who he's going to kill or he's going to engage with on the other side of a mission. And what does it mean for him to bring this level of violence and answer to bear? And how does he frame that within a world that's seated within a code for him that also works in general ways? And that means that at times he has to be, he has to be, he's aware of the need to sacrifice himself for his role should he ever be called to account. Like he'd never kill a cop. If a cop was going to shoot him and he was going to die at the hands of a cop, he would let himself be killed or he would run away. There's certain lines that he will not cross. Yeah. And, and that's so interesting because today I see people trying to, you know, skirt kind of the system, but they don't have a guiding set of principles. Or if they do, they don't fully understand them. They're inconsistent. They haven't thought through to the next level. And so that's where I think a lot of confusion comes in. So we well, have people who, right? Yeah. Well, and that's the avatars of meaning. Like you think about the brilliance of our civil rights leaders, right? Like John Lewis on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, the training and discipline they had was so extraordinary. I mean, they had to visualize these, these white cops who were beating them. They had training to visualize them as little boys, right? As, as, so that they wouldn't sort of engage in another way. And to bear the cross and the consequences with a pureness of action that was so um, clear and undeniable that the system itself was proven corrupt and toxic and crumbled around them and their willingness to take the sacrifices that they had, right? And I think what we see now is a lot of signaling for different sort of moral positions that, that at times can feel quite performative or abstract. And people want to have all of the benefit of having a superior moral position on whatever side of the spectrum they're going to choose without the hardcore sacrifices that are necessary to say, I will move in the face of the law and my, my you know, undaunted spirit and moral clarity in the face of it is enough to bring the law crumbling down around me. And that's what, you know, Nelson Mandela did, right? And from the from a room, 27 years in a room the size of a king-size mattress, right? That's what Solzhenitsyn did when he wrote the Gulag Archipelago. And so we tend to forget the broader context of what constitutes sort of moral decision-making. And of course, I'm not implying that Evan Smoke is a figure uh, of, of, of peace or great moral bearing, but he's aware of the rules and the laws and what constitutes sacrifice and where the different what the choices are and what constitutes actual moral clarity or thundering moral judgment. And he's never going to sort of claim that or wear that in different ways. The most important exchange in this book in some ways is his, his, his discussion with Naomi Templeton, who's a letter of the law, um, secret service agent, federal agent, um, wonderful kind of cat and mouse relationship with him throughout a lot of the books in the series. And he's talking to her a lot about why he engages with what he's doing and that for him, the one absolute that he's found and he can hold on to, and I've noticed both of you do this in your own extracurricular work beyond Bookstorm, is if he says, if there's somebody who is suffering, right, concrete, no shit, hardcore in your bone marrow suffering, and I can alleviate that, that's the closest thing to an absolute good that I can find with my skill set and my limitations and all of my flaws and, and who I am as a character. And so that exchange with Naomi really sets up his confrontation in this book for the first time with a with a a, a nemesis with a antagonist who Ev Evan could easily kill Luke Divine a hundred ways by fist by gun by knife he is not a physical threat Luke Divine is a psychological and emotional threat he is a master manipulator and so Evan has to sort of the book is the process of him getting himself in order to confront somebody who is a master of, of psychological manipulation and who's also brilliant. He's manic and brilliant and can make all sorts of arguments and twist the world around to his own means. And that's the central conflict of The Last Orphan. Yeah, I, I really love that. In fact, I had that written down to talk to you about when uh, she asks him, 
Why do you help people, Evan, to atone? No, because of what the government made me. There's only one thing I'm good at. What, morals? No, good. How do you decide what's good? How do you get to decide what's good? And then you brought up that he said, uh, there's no getting around suffering. But if someone's being terrorized at the hands of another person, that's different. I'm not talking about suffering over ideals or ideas. I'm talking about when it's too painful for any of that, when you can see it in their eyes, bone deep suffering. These are the characters that you talked about that made changes throughout history too. So I guess Evan's showing us, we can't fight every wrong. We can't go out uh, getting revenge on everyone. But if we see human atrocity happening, maybe this is time for us to rise up. And I, I wanted to ask you this about Luke Devine because he was, he was a character that I was just so intrigued by. Uh, Echo warns Evan. She goes, he makes you do stuff. And Evan wonders how until he feels the pull himself without giving spoilers. What was it about this character? Was he the classic textbook narcissist? Did he believe himself to be God? He was manipulating, gaslighting. The end goal was just that he could shine. Did he really care about his cause? I can't give away spoilers, but Evan, you put something in Evan keen enough to know, even in this case, what is really evil and what isn't, what is good enough to fight for and what isn't, it threw a little twist and I can't really give any more spoilers, but what was it about this character? Because we love to hate him. We love to mm. hate him. Well, he's quite complicated, right? There's a lot of, you know, I've had occasion um, to be in the presence of a lot of people who are, who are, you know, spectacularly brilliant, some of whom are billionaires, some of whom are altering the world, right, all the time. You don't get to be a billionaire, right, or, or, or a tech genius, let's say, or a innovator, entrepreneur at a scale that is world changing or world altering without having some rough edges, right, without having some ideas that are wildly unconventional, because you're breaking through a system and inventing another one or you're breaking through a whole notion. You know, Steve Jobs, for instance, he just thought about a phone long enough until it was no longer a phone, right? He thought about music long enough until he could, you know, put a whole universe in your pocket with music. Um, I wrote a, um, well, we don't need to detour about that. Um, but, and so a lot of times with somebody who's a wildly unconventional, brilliant thinker, that's who Luke Devine is. Luke is brilliant. He's figured out, he's, he's hypomanic he, or, or fully manic at times. He can move at the speed of light. Evan reminds him at some point, he says, you know, everyone thinks that there's a superpower in going fast, right? There's an immense superpower in going slow in being intentional, in observing, right? And being very present. That's part of what Evan has mastered with his meditation and his training is to see everything as if for the first time. And what a skill that is, right? Part of that is tactical. Um, you know, if he's leaving, he needs to see if the deadbolt is you know, four millimeters from where he left it. But imagine anytime you have an argument with your spouse or your kid or a friend, that's, a, that's the same old argument you've been having. Imagine if you had the power to approach that as if it's the first time you'd ever had that conversation and to see everything as if for the first time. There's a constant newness. In Zen, it's called beginner's mind, right? So his whole meditative process is to go slow and observe. And Luke goes really fast. And Evan tells him, when you go really fast, you miss things right? There's little skips and hiccups in what your carefully constructed morality is. And he finds some of them with Luke Devine. Um, and so Luke is brilliant. I love, I love writing Luke. He's powerful and he's narcissistic and he's got incredible, incredible mental and cerebral horsepower. And he's a great um, counter to, to Evan in a different sort of way. He hits a different part of Evan than any character that I've invented yet. And I think Evan had to be grown up through you know, seven novels in order to meet him or eight. And in uh, order to, to know how to deal with them. Eight novels. <laughs> eight with novels. more to come, more to come. Yes. So part of that process of becoming means that he can now face a psychological adept 
assault on his morals and his code in a different way than he would have been able to in the earlier books. So would you say Luke Devent Devin is a different kind of evil? Maybe not the evil that, that Evan normally would be answering a phone call to? An evil that's pretending to do good? Now we're going back to this whole justice. What's Well, what is- and I don't know. It's also very hard to figure out who or what constitutes evil, right? And so with Luke, I will say that, you know, Evan has to figure out if he's somebody who is on where Luke fits in this mission, right? Because he is told that he cannot, he's told basically he can choose his code, right? Or he can give up his code or give up his life. And he's tasked with the president with killing Luke Devine. And he basically is like, if I can find a way that this guy fits within my code as somebody to be destroyed and decimated, I will take him out if he gets an inch out of line for my code, but I'm no longer going to go after and execute people on behalf of a government for a series of codes and power plays that I don't fully comprehend. And so Luke, to my mind, isn't necessarily evil. He represents an immense amount of power and an immense amount of influence. But is he using that as well as anybody else might, right? Is he a better devil who we know? I don't know. Those are all questions that are up for grabs. And that, that's great. I love it. Yeah, I want to kind of dive into that a little deeper for our last question, because Luke Devine calls himself a vice merchant, a collector of sins, and he believes his role to be necessary. He won't let people get away with bad acts, he says. And he says even their badness kind of keeps us on our toes, you know, so we know what's worse coming down the road. But Luke encourages people to engage in these vices, which is a problem. He overlooks the fact that all people fail. We all have moments of weakness. And I was wondering if you thought that that's one of the things that sets apart Orphan X, Evan, and Luke Devine, because there's that recognition that humans are fallible and sometimes weak, but they try, that Evan has. Do you think that's one of the big distinctions? Hmm. That's really interesting. I think that they both allow people, look, they're playing different games. They both have an awareness that people are flawed and can make bad choices or get themselves in shitty situations. Luke ultimately is a power broker. He wants power. So he puts all these sins on display and all the people can choose them. It's all of their own choice, right? It's like Pleasure Island in Pinocchio, right? Everyone gets to choose what they want, but it then he has something to hold over them. And Evan, look, Evan's not online. He's the nowhere man. He's not in the databases. He doesn't have any fingerprints, right? He's he's he doesn't exist in the same world he drinks the world's best vodkas distilled 17 times because that distillation process in some ways mirrors the process of his own training right and his own striving toward purity it's like a purification ritual for him he doesn't have a lot of vices on display for luke to grab hold of but he has some and luke gets his tentacles in there but i do think that evan evan's game is not to wield the most power that he possibly can. He's not interested in that game. He's interested in trying to figure out where his his unique skill set, which is varied. You know, one of the things I say I've mentioned before, he's a uh, a, rent, a a blue collar Renaissance man. There's the, the agency that predated the CIA said that their ideal recruit is a PhD who could win a bar fight. So I think of Evan that way. Like he's where he is, where he has knowledge isn't for it being intellectual. He understands accents. He understands food. He understands etiquette from different countries. He speaks a lot of languages. He studied military history, but it's all aligned with the strategic and with the practical. It's not just to show off how smart he is, right? And so a lot of it is with him is what he wants to do is bring that totality of himself to a mission in order to reduce somebody's suffering to put something back on course in some way that's aligned with that moral and strategic and tactical view of the world. And that's all he can do. And that's a very different game than the one Luke's playing. Luke wants as much power as possible. Evan's power is contained within himself. Evan's power is the basis of who he is. Yeah. How, how can I call Evan? Cause I might need him for a mission. We all, we all want to call him. <laughs> you can call one eight five five to nowhere. And you can okay. an answer. So okay, give it a well, try. We're going to do it. And listeners, if this discussion hasn't made you go crazy for this, the last orphan, I don't know what will. It's going to entertain, but you're going to learn something. 
I mean, you're gonna learn something about society, about justice, and maybe even something about yourself. So thank you, Greg Hurwitz. And before you leave, let me tell our listeners how they can connect with you. You can find him on gregherwitz.net. You can get on his email list to be the first on any of the latest news. You can find him on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And Greg, what a great discussion. Thoroughly enjoyed the book and loved this discussion too. Thanks for being our guest oh, on Bookstore. Thank you. I appreciate you guys having me. Absolutely. Take care, Take care now. Hope to see Greg back on here again because, oh my goodness, this character is so fantastic and I can't wait for the next book. Um, Kristen, you brought up some cool stuff I thought here today. Um, this dilemma on how do we decide what's good? Can one person decide what's good? And what do you do when the justice system isn't working, when the police force is corrupt? when uh, you don't get the answers or the, uh, the justification or the, uh, uh, the closure that you need for some type of crime or hurt that you sustain. We, in our innermost gut, this notion of taking matter in our own hands feels sort of good. Or better yet, I'd like to put it in Evan's hands, not even maybe in my own hands. <laughs> but what do you think? Yeah, for, uh, first of all, that's a great question because um, I love that Evan Smoke has a notion in his mind of what is good. You know, for him, alleviating true suffering is something that he can vibe with that. That's where he wants to make an impact and affect one person's life. To him, that is good. And you know what? I, I have to agree. You know, I, there's a lot of people who say, well, you can't just say there's good and bad. No, I think you can. You know, I think things that are good lead in a healthful direction, a whole direction. There's some kind of integrity there. And things that are bad are the opposite. They disintegrate, right? There's harm that follows. And so, you know, he has this general idea of what to him is good. And then he uses his skills and pursues it. And I do, I have to, you know, give props there. I think that's something that a lot of people have never thought fully through in their own life. What do I regard as good? And how do I make more good happen? What do you think? Well, I think that's a gray area because you just said good always results in something good and evil results in something bad. But Evan is forced to kill in order to get good. So is killing good? Or do we sometimes have to resort to perhaps something that we don't consider to be good in order to reach good? Now here's yeah. where it gets to be a little bit of a gray area. Right, because he's removing people that are causing more harm in the world. And, you know, and again, we are in a gray area and people are gray areas. Everybody's not a black and white villain or a good person. But I think in his economy, the idea is that the absence of this person will lead to more good in the world because now he can't harm or cause difficulties for years to come. Mm -hmm. I don't know. The ultimate quest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But getting there can be tricky. Yeah, it, it yeah. was a thrill ride. I could not put this book down. There was something else that hit me and I wanted to talk to a Greg about it, but we ran out of time. This notion of archetype. Tommy said, deep down, everyone's an archetype of some sort. Most folks just pretend to cover themselves up and pretend otherwise. There are no new stories. We're all in the thrall of old ways. Okay, so what is he getting at here? even Evan, is there not an original person? Is there not an original thought? Like is even Evan looking towards a hero in his life, someone that he heard of or fantasized about? Um, this is an interesting concept. Are each of us an archetype? I mean, we think we're out here doing something new, even with Bookstorm, we, we're original. And by the way, we are, because people don't ask the questions we ask. They ask stuff like, I just start writing. What's your, you know, what's your next book going to be and things like that. We talk about the book. We read the whole entire book. But are we an archetype? It sort of blew my mind. Right. In fact, there's a, a Bible verse that basically says there's nothing new under the sun. And I think it's getting towards that idea of no matter how much evil you can devise in your heart, Somebody's already thought of that and has already done it. But I like your question because you also put that on the good side, right? 
is are the good things that we do, the wholeness and the and the light that we bring to the world, is that also something that's not new? You know, I don't know. What do you think? I, well, all I know is I tell my kids this all the time. My my 28 nieces and nephews, they'll say, Aunt Chris, we can't tell you what's going on. Um, you wouldn't ever, you couldn't imagine, and you're just going to be shocked. And I say to them all the time, there's nothing new under the sun. You're calling it That's something right. different. I've seen it all before in my old age. Pretty much, I think I've seen it all. Maybe some things I'm happy I haven't seen, but um, I don't know. I think it's cool. And I guess I like the idea. Yeah, you're right. Maybe archetype is good. Maybe there's a lot we can learn. Listen, humans have been on this planet for thousands of years. And if we can't learn something good from those who came before us, and maybe also look at the evil and say, I don't want to be that, we're missing out on something. Maybe it's yeah. good to be an archetype. Well, and that's why we love these recurring characters, because not only do we see them grow, like Evan Smoke, we've seen him go from one position to maturity, to thinking differently about his life, to wanting to grow that humanity. And we see him encountering new situations each time. And so how do you now put that into practice? Well, when you encounter a new situation, you react better or differently. But that's what we're all doing, too, as we mature and grow. At least I hope so. Mm -hmm. Definitely. You know, we, I know so, some people are stuck at 15, you know. <laughs> so we're all going to get off here and we're going to call Evan. You know, we're all going to call. <laughs> Greg, get ready. Your phone lines are going to be busy if it's you answering. And really all we want to say to uh, Greg Hurwitz is, come on. We want to say to Greg Hurwitz and Orphan X, come on over for dinner. <laughs> That's all oh, we're looking for. So anyway, we, we had a great discussion. And um, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I want to leave you with a few storm predictions. I want to thank our sound engineer and producer or Mark Carey. You don't get to see him here live, but he's behind the scenes helping us even today before we got started. Um, we're going to be interviewing Madeline Martin, the keeper of hidden books, Katie Quinn and Janie Chang, the Phoenix Crown, Matthew Quirk, Inside Threat, Marie Benedict and Victoria Christopher Murray, the First Ladies, Viola Shipman, famous in a small town, Ashley Audrin, The Whispers, Fiona Davis, The Spectacular, Sandra Brown, Out of Nowhere, and Tiffany Hammond, A Day Without Words. I cannot wait to discuss those. And listeners, thank you so much for sharing our socials, for spreading the word. We are growing, and that's because you are listening, you're writing in, asking for these fantastic authors, and we are humbled and grateful. And of course, we want you to stay on the radar with us by visiting us at bookstormpodcast.com. You can find us on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, on TikTok. And of course, our YouTube channel is very active. You can search for Bookstorm and Podcast and you'll find us there. Until next time, listeners, one of the best ways to brave the storm is to dive down deep into life-changing fiction.